The following is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television, bringing you topics in the way mainstream media won't. BaseNet Internet Television presents As We See It with Fred Boaz and friends. In Los Angeles, I'm Gene White. And now to our studios in Boston. Thank you, Gene, and welcome everybody to another exciting adventure of As We See It. This show is being recorded on Sunday, February 26, 2012. This is show number 32. So, Gene, it's Oscar night tonight as we're reporting this, recording this show. And is Los Angeles, your fair city, all uh, ablaze tonight in Oscar glory? Of course. All the buzz. That's all that's on their minds right now, even where I work. They're not doing nothing but talking about the Oscars and the movies that are going to win, who's going to win Best Actor, who's going to win Best Actress, Best Sound Editing, you know, all that stuff. And uh, it's quite, quite exciting. I'm looking forward to seeing what happens by the end of the night tonight. And I guess uh, we'll be talking a little bit about the Oscar presentations throughout the show, even though we're recording it pre-Oscar. Um, but Holly, I guess on Crashing Glass uh, podcast this week, uh, you guys are going to be talking a little bit about the Oscars? Oh, yeah. We're going to talk about the Oscars. We're going to talk about mostly the fashion, you know, the fun stuff. We're going to have uh, Ashley L. be on uh, the designer who joined us also for the Golden Globes. So this should be a lot of fun. All right, we're looking forward to that. Next Friday will be uh, your Crashing Glass podcast show with your Oscar coverage. And now to backtrack a bit, as Gene said, I'm Ed Jupin here in Boston Studios. We have Fred Boaz in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania. That was Holly Hurley in St. Louis, along with Gene White in Los Angeles, California, and Larry the Lobster in Brookline, Massachusetts. Now, officially, welcome, guys. How is everybody? Living the dream. Oh, doing very well. Doing too much studying. <laughs> well, that's 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 two out of five anyway. Doing very well, Ed. Very well. <laughs> good. So, what do you guys have planned for this week? Got a lot of good stuff up. You are you wanting me to start us off with uh with the uh, baby scam here, Fred? Well, no. A California lawyer, and I was telling this to people before that, coming out of San Diego. A federal judge sentenced an internationally renowned surrogacy lawyer Friday, to, uh, Friday last week, to five months in prison and nine months of home confinement for her role in a baby selling scheme that prosecutors say spanned two continents and netted millions of dollars. Uh, Teresa Erickson acknowledged that she, had two, that she and two other women used numerous surrogate mothers to create an inventory of unborn babies that they would sell for more than $100,000 each, according to federal prosecutors. Now, U.S. surrogates were sent, to, were sent to be impregnated in Ukraine with embryos from anonymous donors. When the women were in their third, second trimester, Erickson and her conspirators offered the babies to prospective parents, telling them the developing fetuses were a result of legal surrogacy agreements agreements in which the original parents had backed out. Erickson used her fame as a leading rep reproductive law specialist to win the trust of both the surrogates and the intended parents. During sentencing, the judge, uh, Andrew Battaglia, said Erickson caused a parade of tragedy that included stress on surrogates who learned late in their pregnancies that they were, that they were really no parents for the unborn children. Apparently, one surrogate mother, a girl named Kimberly Schooley, told the judge she miscarried and was forced to name and cremate, uh, and cremate the child by herself. Under a legal arrangement, the judge pointed out the surrogate mother would have had the support of the prospective parents. Battaglia called the, 25, uh, the 44-year-old Erickson a ringleader who used her knowledge to work the system of, in California, the hub of the surrogacy industry, and to dodge its progressive laws designed to protect surrogate mothers, prospective parents, and the babies. She also tainted the birth stories uh, of, the, uh, of, of the babies, she said. I, I don't know, and I agree with the judge. I am offended by this, personally. I, I mean, I don't know. It, it's a very weird situation because on one hand, you're like, you know, uh, there are a lot of people out there looking for babies, and this lady had kind of the inside scoop. You know, some might argue that she was just an opportunist, but I just think the fact that she's a lawyer, that just makes me... And how prevalent is this? Is this prevalent? prevalent a lot of this well, going I mean, on I, I, don't, I don't really think so because there are there are I, I know people in parts of New Jersey that I know personally who have adopted children from China now it's a white couple they've gone to China three or four times to pick up 
of course, female children because China they get they get rid of the females for whatever reason their culture is. But they have adopted three children from three different, uh, and they did it legally through the system. Went overseas. What what I think is 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 bad about this is that they that the women were impregnated in Ukraine and were told, and that, that the parents were lied to about the fact that they that this was all done through legal surrogacy, which the parents have backed out. Well, I just I think it's kind of creepy that uh, that these girls were being impregnated and then they were. Some of them apparently, you know, were upset because there was then no mom for the baby. So here you have someone who was intending to sell a baby for a hundred thousand dollars. It's now a parent, and I don't know. It begs the question, kind of, you know, did did I mean? Obviously, she's sending them to the Ukraine to like get impregnated. So you wonder, like, at what point do they go? Maybe this lady's not legit. You know, I don't know. It just seemed very. Strange. It also seems a little strange. These girls didn't know about it. I mean, how do you go to the Ukraine and get impregnated? Unless they're they're trying to figure out. I mean, you know, I mean, there are there are sperm banks here and egg banks here that can be used for the same purpose. So I, I agree with you 100 percent on that one. Yeah, I, that's the weird part about this. Is like, why the Ukraine? I mean, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna maybe she was trying not to leave a trail or something, but then that just makes it all the more shady. So it's just very strange. I don't know. I just think it's weird. I mean, there is no end. I I think it's interesting that p- people in this country are just so desperate to get children. I mean, you know, I work at a homeless shelter for teenage girls and. You know, there there are a lot of unwanted children here in this country, and I know there's a lot of red tape, and I know there are a lot of things you have to go through to adopt those children, and it's not an inexpensive or easy process, but neither is having your own baby. But a lot of it comes by, and I think this is something that someone once told me, I don't remember who it was, most people when they adopt a child, they want to adopt a baby. They don't want to adopt a 13-year-old or an 11-year-old or a 5-year-old, whatever. And a lot of these teenage kids that are in these homeless shelters that are ready to be adopted would love to go to anybody's home and, and, and have a real home to live in and a whole bit like that. But they're not cute little babies you can raise from, from a pup, so to speak, that, you know, that that they may not be exactly perfect, they may have had some problems, and the people, they, they want, they want, they, they, they want everybody to think that they had this little child, because a lot of people who are adopting kids want people to think that it's their own child naturally. I was just going to say, and some people also don't want to adopt outside of their own ethnicity either. Right, and, and that, that's part of the problem. You, you get a 13-year-old out of a homeless shelter, and there's nothing wrong with that, the parents, for whatever reason, and that kid would, would probably appreciate the home that they're getting. Some do, some don't. But, you know, I mean, I mean the fact that, it, that they're all these babies, you know, like you said, Holly, they're these kids in these homeless shelters, that's where these people should be going. Yeah, I just, I mean, I understand all sides of it. I've had friends who've had trouble conceiving, and, and I, I get that it's a very emotional thing, but I guess that's a part of the reason that John and I sort of made a decision before we got married. It doesn't matter if the kid looks like us. We didn't, you know, I'm obviously, you know, running, and I'm still in school, and then I'll have a job in which it's going to be a while before I really have some good time off, you know, or we'll want to take time off. You know, I mean, we don't know if we're ever going to want to have our own kids, and we were so happy to think, you know, they're always unwanted kids who need parents and who cares if they look yep, like there's always options you know it's just right. like what you guys talked about on last week's or this past week's uh, crashing glass podcast called pet chicks p-e-t chicks your your guest was talking about you know obviously being against puppy mills and puppy farms and that thing type of thing because there's you know just so many uh, no-kill animal shelters and animal shelters in general that are just loaded with these pets and especially these no-kill shelters who just hold on to these animals forever if they don't get adopted uh, there's plenty of pets or animals looking for homes sa- same you. same thing with humans you know there's, there's plenty of these um, you know even like Fred said teenage kids that need a home I have a friend of mine who adopted a pet from a shelter, and the dog is just all over this guy because they, she realizes that she had... Now, a lot of these kids you know, that are in these shelters, a lot of them, not all of them, a lot of them are troubled kids, but if they have a structured home life, many of these kids turn around. And it's a shame that all these kids are out there, they want to be products of the system, and many of them, many of them want to be having problems later on, where if they'd have had the structured home life, even in, even as late as their teens, they would have turned around and not been part of the problem, uh, not become a problem later on. I mean, I think that's, I think that's true, and I, but I do understand that some people do want to raise a child from a baby, but there are also a lot of unwanted babies out there, and yeah, the process is not easy, and I've heard, you know, that it's a very difficult thing to do, and sometimes people sort of go around the system, but I just feel there are 
always alternatives and I just think it's it's unfortunate that this sort of went down this way because I think this lady probably had the best interest you know she probably saw well, she probably met both mothers who who had children they didn't know what to do with and met families who desperately wanted a baby and thought hey I could fix that but it just the way it went down was just totally illegal and sketchy and involved another country for some odd reason <laughs> so I so anyway, any, any opinion, Shane? I'm just sitting here thinking about, uh, you know, there are those parents that really want to take babies or, or even children into their households to, to bring them up. I, I got a friend out here in California. They have a, like four or five Down syndrome children, but they, they chose to do that because they want to give those children a chance too. And uh, they're they're raised well. They're raised uh, with all the values and everything like that. And you know, if, if there if there are people out there that that are like that, I mean, it doesn't matter how old they are, they're going to take that child in there and raise them. And what this lady does it was really despicable because, you know, there are people that want babies, and then she's saying, oh, there's no you know, no parents or whatever for that baby or whatever. And um, it's it's really a, a sticky situation all the way around when you think about it. Well, part of the issue is, and a lot, and I'm not saying all, again, you have to, we have to put a disclaimer, we're not talking about all of them, but a lot of the people that are adopting overseas or adopting, and some of them that are adopting through the illegal baby mill, for lack of a better word, are people that cannot qualify for adoptions within this country for the legal adoption system. But they're also but, paying ridiculous amounts for that, just oh, from I, documentaries I that, that I've seen about that. I mean, yeah, you know, huge amounts of money works. for these babies, yeah. But what's the child worth to have in your house? It comes down to how much is it worth for you to have a child. I don't know. It's a lot of money. Oh, mm. yeah. Well, this was a this was a big difference this week because we actually uh, we started with we let out with that story which I thought was really interesting. But but I do I do want to make sure that we visit Larry for a second and talk about maybe some lobster tails this week. I know he's got some interesting ones. How's that sound, Larry? Sounds good. What do you got for us? Number one is. You are about one centimeter taller in the morning than in the evening. Number two, the opposite sides of a dice cube always adds up to seven. Number three, whispering is more wearing than a normal speaking tone. Number four, in 1977, a 13-year-old boy had a tooth growing out of his left foot. Me, 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 pick me. Go, go, go. Number two, I'd like to know, I guess the question is, do we have any gamblers on our panel? They might know about number two. Uh, and, yes, and, yes, and, number th and then number three, Gene, do you have anything to say about number three with uh, being a radio person for so long? So number two, do we have any gamblers that could verify the dice thing? It happens to be true. The sides of dice to equal seven. Somehow I knew Fred was a gambler. No, I thought I was a gambler. <laughs> Dice equal seven. That, that, that's just something I found interesting with, the, with this uh, dice. Cool. And Gene, what do you think about the whispering voice as opposed to our normal tone of voice? Uh, I'll get to that one in a minute. But the first one, I, I think I figured out why we're an inch centimeter taller than we are when we're standing up or whatever. Oh, please do, because the rest of us can figure it out. Because when you're laying down, your body spreads out. There you go. And so... So it's a little more taller or whatever. Because, but when it's, you because, stand it's, up relaxed, weight, because it's relaxed, Stephen. Your muscles are yeah, relaxed. Exactly. And oh, then when you're good. standing up, you have the weight all, you know, your weight's all the way down, you know. Yeah, Holly right. might know something about this as a fitness trainer. Well, yeah, no, that, that Gene's right. A lot of it has to do with gravity, actually, mm -hmm. um, and just the, the direction. If you think about it, gravity's pulling straight down on your head and on and it's compressing all of your bones and your joints. It also... Uh, when your when your body's heavier, it actually increases that pressure uh, more, which makes perfect sense. But yeah, so no, James. Well, guy right. at six foot in the morning, he's two foot three in the afternoon. Hey, don't talk about Craig that way. Ah. Oh, no, uh, <laughs> no last names, please. Anyway, not, not uh, that they, not that anybody would know who he is by his last name. Anyway. <clears throat> I know, I know. Anyway, and then the third one we were talking about, of course, the reason it's worse to whisper than it is to talk normal, because when you're talking and you're singing, you always want to use your diaphragm. When you're whispering, there's no way you're going to be able to do your diaphragm. It's going to go through your throat instead. 
And so that's why it's not as good to, you know, whisper. Well, uh, yeah, technically, Gene, it actually has to do, uh, I know you guys know this as well, but, you know, uh, for those who don't, as a vocalist, you learn a lot about the science behind this. And I actually had a vocal injury, Gene, because I was speaking, you know, like you were talking about not fully supported. And right. more than more than even just the support, it's when you're speaking normally or you're singing, you're compressing the whole vocal cord together. Or right. you're you know, you're you're pushing it all the way together, whereas when you're whispering, you're allowing air to go through. So That's just right, tiny Holly. pieces of exactly. it are touching at a time. And when those yep. tiny pieces are touching, they're only grating on one spot as opposed to distributing the vibration along the whole. There you go. Exactly. Now that we verified three out of Wow, four. yeah, those are some interesting little known facts this week. So what's number four? <laughs> A tooth out of the kid's left foot? I don't know about that one. Guys, there are like every, like if you Google this, everybody agrees it happened in 1977. There are hundreds of websites that mention it offhand. But what makes me curious about it is none of them are ones I would consider like, there. Are, there's like an EMT site that says it, but none of the major... No reputable sites. Right, like no, no place where I would actually fact check something. But it seems right. to be a well-known fact. Like everyone agrees that it happened in 77. Everyone agrees... Well, 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 fact well yeah, you know, everybody agrees that Roswell happened also in 1947 or something, but yeah, you can't verify it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's so true. I, would, I think it'd be interesting to see a photo. <laughs> Interesting and also probably a little gross. There you go, Larry. Try to find a photo. Well, so well, I'll look and uh, well, I'll take a look and see if I can find one. But there's no guarantee. That's definitely that's definitely something that belongs in Ripley's Believe It or Not. Yes, it sure. does. Yes, it does. So back to real news. What do you guys have uh, as number two on your real news agenda? A lot of women in this in this day and age, and my wife is one, don't normally, as a, as a rule, take their husband's last name as their own when they get married. And I know my sister, who is a professional... Does woman, that seem to be the norm these days, that they it, don't take uh, it? it? Basically, that in the mid, according to a, a an article here, it says not taking husband's last, the husband's last name, you may be judged harshly. According to the article, attitudes regarding whether women should take or their husband's last name at marriage are becoming more conservative, at least among the Western, uh, Midwesterners. Now, apparently, during the time in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, it was a kind of a 50-50. That seems to be going back more the other way. I don't see any problem with it. I mean, a woman or a man, I mean, there's no law saying that a woman has to change her last name. As a matter of fact, I know a guy in New Jersey who when he and his wife got married before they got divorced, he took her last name. So, did women take their husband's last name or don't for different reasons. My wife didn't want that because my stepson has her maiden name. She also did it to honor her father because she wanted to, and you know, I mean, I don't have a problem with it. She uses both. She uses neither. She, it doesn't matter. A lot of professional women continue their last name, their maiden name after they get licenses in the business world. I know my sister did that because they're known before they get married in the business world. So and as, as do people in our industry. You know, Holly, for the most part, does it, at least in her media career. Uh, Jill Henley does it in her media career. Yeah, you know, actually, for me, it was really similar to one of the things that Fred mentioned, my equity cards in my maiden name. And so there you go. It's, it's made it very difficult to switch over because, you know, my union name, you know how it is in equity, it's like impossible to, uh, sure, that's to how you're credited, right? You don't want to yeah, change exactly. that. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's really hard. But also, I think, though, Fred, you'd be boggled at the other things. I mean, there are a lot of... I took a gender differences in negotiation course, and even just the things that are on a resume uh, are judged very differently, sometimes more harsh towards the women, sometimes more harsh towards the men. But it's interesting because things like this uh, reflect poorly, as you said, on certain women, but something like missing a year of work employers will actually give women the benefit of the doubt that they took time off to have a baby, strangely enough. But if you have a break in your resume, they're going to want to know why. Like they're going to they're going to actually think maybe you're not serious or maybe you're unemployed or maybe you don't have drive. So it's it's interesting because you know, something like this is just another example of how we're sort of all not on the same page yet. The, 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 the question I have is what does it matter? I mean, 
whether you call yourself Holly Hurley, Holly Feather, Holly Hurley Feather, what's the difference? You're still the same person. You're still married to John, and it doesn't matter, just like my wife and I. She's still married whether she has my last name or not. Her driver's license is in her married name slash uh, maiden, uh, maiden name slash driver. Her credit card is in that, but she uses her maiden name for most things that she signs, and it doesn't make a difference. She's still the same person. No, it's very true. I think, uh, you know, John and I talked about this. Uh, obviously, we got married because it was it was this issue of like he wanted our kids to have the same name as me. You know, that was one of the reasons why I took it on at all. My original thought was maybe not, but then you know, if you go to pick your kid up from the hospital, you want someone to know whose kid it is. Well, that 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 we took care of. That's very simple. You put the person's name down. But the thing is, is that it's it gets to the point where, like my sister, when she started out in business, she started out before it was before she got married. And she's known in the industry. She's in the fashion industry. Is known in the industry as under her maiden name. And when she got married, she tried for several years to use her married name, and people wouldn't talk to her because they didn't know who she was. She finally sure, she back built up her reputation she, under she, her maiden name. So right. she went back to her maiden name, and now when you, you you look at the Polo Ralph Lauren website where she works, it's under her maiden name. And yet, her kids have her husband's name, and everybody understands that. It seems that more professional people understand it, and a lot of un- uh, a lot of not unprofessional, but right. people not in the in what you would call professional people seem to not understand it as much. I mean, if you look at at actors and actresses, like you said, Holly, they get married. They can get married eight. Elizabeth Taylor was married eight times. She's still Elizabeth Taylor. She never right. changed her name to whatever her husband's name was. And yes, some actresses do. Well, it's true, and you actually mentioned something interesting, and this is going to sound uh, slanderous since I'm in the Midwest currently, but one of the things that the case studied was there is a big difference in the in this perception between the Northeast and the Midwest, and it's a lot stronger in the Midwest, and I think a big part of that is most women, I know for me, most of the women I knew who were living in New York were very career-driven, and it was about the professional for them, and that was a big deal for them. Whereas here, even though I know a lot, obviously, being in business school, of career-driven women, it's a little, and I mean, in, in business school, it's very de rigueur. Everybody, everybody either does or doesn't, nobody cares. But among people who are not in business school, it is sort of a thing that people look twice about or they'll make jokes about. Whereas on the East Coast, you never would do, you know, in New York, in Boston, you would never do that. You just assume there was a good reason why the woman does it the way she does. And you know, the thing is, a lot of the people in that school are not going to be remaining in the Midwest. A lot of them will be going to Los Angeles, and maybe some of them will, but Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, Boston, whatever you want. I mean, so they're, they're there for the education and leaving, so it really doesn't matter. And Gene, well, just to go around the table, Larry has never been married. I was. My wife took, my ex-wife took my name. Gene, your wife is not a career person in like media or something so no. that being said what did she do she used she took your name yeah she took my name yeah she toyed with either uh keeping the you know her uh, maiden name and putting them together but um kind of worked out she just left it uh you know the, my took last your name because yeah. her, her 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 maiden name was Wiemeyer. you know it's like a german name and then mm-hmm. of course my last name being white a lot but, easier uh, <laughs> Well, it's a lot easier for people to spell. <laughs> but what's funny is when she um, when she looked at her initials after we got married, they didn't change because yeah. it was S M W. Still a W, you right? There you know, go. When she was Weimar, and now it's yeah. S M W with white, so it never changed. Pretty cool. So even I, just I, amongst I, ourselves, there's kind of like a fifty-fifty split here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. All right, well, I guess we'll uh, keep going here. Maybe we'll go into some territory that'll be interesting to Ed and talk about some more uh, phone stuff. Tech news of the week? Yeah. Well, tech news of the week. Uh, well, tech a, news of whatever. A story yeah. that Fred wanted to talk about was a new Ubuntu app coming out. Ubuntu is has been, for the past five to ten years, the number one Linux distribution. Linux, you have... Literally uh, hundreds of different vari- variations, all on a few basic kernels, which is the heart of the system. But then people could vary that kernel to uh, make what they call distributions. And anybody could actually do that. You have the kernel, it's your right to set up your own distribution. We could have BaseNet Linux if we chose to. That being said, Ubuntu has been the number one distro for at least five to ten years, probably closer to ten years. And 
as everybody probably knows, Android phones do run Linux. Android is a Google, which is a Linux operating system. And Ubuntu is coming out with something called, or it's actually already out, I was looking at it. It's called um, the Ubuntu for Android, I believe it's an app. And basically, if you're already using the Ubuntu Linux operating system, it'll combine everything on your Android phone. It's basically a launcher. Uh, if you have an Android phone, you're familiar with different launchers. You have Launcher Pro, you have the uh, original Android launcher. You know, you can pick whatever launcher you want. They do different things. The user interface looks different. Well, and I can go ahead and tell you I have no idea what the difference are between those things. I have well, an they're, Android they're, phone. I definitely The difference in mostly user interface appearance. They all look differently, and you can configure them differently. Bottom line, you do the same with them all but it's a personal preference, is because the user interfaces look different, some are actually easier to use than others. So it doesn't hurt trying different launchers because you might find one that you like better. My favorite, because I have tried several, is ones that I have or had, had Larry the Lobster on, Fred on, I use it myself. It's called Launcher Pro. It's, in my opinion, the right now pretty much the best uh, launcher app out there for the Android phones. But anyway, this Ubuntu for Android is that. It's a launcher. The only problem with it, and that's not a problem, it's only a problem for a generic Android phone user, is your phone needs to be rooted before you could use it. So, which just means that in terms of Think back to your regular phones when you got a phone from AT&T or Verizon or whoever, and it was, they called it locked. It was locked just for their network. Think along those terms. Andro you, have you have to basically unlock it. Yeah, Android phones are locked in the sense of which you can't get into the real nuts and bolts of the Linux operating system unless you, what they call, root it, which is unlocking it. Once you root it, you could then do anything you want to the phone. It's not illegal to do because, again, it's Linux and it's open. It's an open operating system. You could do whatever you want to to your Android phone, unlike iPhone, which, yes, you could root iPhones as well, but then if you have a problem with that iPhone, there's no such thing as Apple giving you any kind of service or warranty coverage Apple on it. will void the warranty on the phone if you jailbreak it or do anything like that. Right, yeah, it's called jailbreak. Thank you. So with Android, where you root the phone, for this uh, Ubuntu to be used, you have to root your phone, and then you could put it on. I'm probably going to do it on my phone this week because I haven't yet rooted my phone. I just haven't needed to. But I probably will this week, and then I'll put the Ubuntu launcher on it because I do use Ubuntu operating system as one of my operating systems. I use both Windows 7 and Ubuntu. So since I already use it, I might as well have it on my phone as well. And once I do have it on my phone as well, I could report back a little bit more. Also in that story that Fred was talking about, it, the story was primarily about REM, which is the uh, current owner of the BlackBerry operating system, who pretty much is on the table these days if somebody is on the market these days, if somebody wants to buy RIM. I don't imagine RIM is going to be the owner much longer if they're trying to find a, a new company. Uh, but in the meantime, they are going to be coming out with a new operating system. It's already at least a year late, basically called BlackBerry 10. The official name of the operating system, QNX, I believe, hence just call it BlackBerry 10. And it should have been out a, almost a year ago, and now I guess it's slated for late 2012 that it's finally going to come out. The problem with this BlackBerry 10 is it's a complete redesign of the operating system. It's really their last gasp at trying to salvage BlackBerry. So this is not going to be an upgrade for your own no, BlackBerry. No, this, this isn't. Blackberry. You, this, you to oh, no, you're, you're going to need a BlackBerry phone or, or tablet. Uh, it's You're not even going to be able to upgrade your device, which is another problem. They were saying by now there was supposed to be at least uh, one BlackBerry phone, smartphone, available at least 
at least for um, people to in the industry to test it and everything to do beta tests and all hasn't even come out yet nobody even knows what a blackberry 10 phone is going to look like they haven't seen anything it's so far behind the time here uh, in my opinion it's going to be too little too late uh, RIM is done, BlackBerry is done. BlackBerry could be salvaged if somebody else buys the company, but I don't think so. I, I think it's just a forgotten technology that's done. It's a shame because, as we've mentioned before on, as we see it way back in our earlier episodes, it's something that literally all of us have used at one time. And, and something that we've all liked at yeah. one time. When it, you know, the original BlackBerry we came out with, I mean, we had some problems with some of the ones we've had in the past, but the original one, BlackBerry is a great device for what, they, for what they are. If they would get, get away from that operating system, I mean, it, even, even like Google buy and make Android BlackBerries. I mean, it, it, it's a great unit. Yeah. Well, so it's, it's probably finished, but later this year we will see QNX. Uh, BlackBerry 10 with some new devices, and uh, maybe it'll be that groundbreaking, that earth-shattering of a device and of an operating system that uh, it actually could turn things around and maybe RIM can stay in the business. And then finally in this, no, we can't use that. I, I have to come up with a new name. Sorry, Leo, I didn't almost mean to steal one of your show names. So finally in our the last story in our tech segment this week, we're going to look back at a story that we talked about a week or two ago about court ruling against the FBI being able to use GPS tracking devices. Since that court ruling took place a few weeks back, the FBI has already turned off at least 3,000 GPS tracking devices that, ha that they had installed on cars of people that they were tracking. You heard it here first, folks. Uh, you know, 3,000 out of, I don't know, you know, who's to say they didn't, they weren't tracking 3 million cars and they're admitting to turning off 3,000, but I guess it's a start. And it is a start, so. Well, I actually, uh, speaking about legal legal throwbacks and tech news, I actually think it's really interesting uh, what happened with AT&T this week, that a judge in Southern California actually ruled that they have to give you the data that you pay for. This is going to open a Pandora's box. Well, why wouldn't, they, first of all, why wouldn't they give you, I mean, if you pay for, the story comes out from Simi Valley that when they started, they were slowing down sur uh, data services for a guy's iPhone. A guy by the name of Matt Scap uh, Well, before, before you go into just too much reading of the text here, the, the gist of this story is that all carriers are doing this now. It's because the bandwidth is just not available. That's why, unless you were grandfathered into a plan on Verizon, AT&T and Sprint is still offering some unlimited plans. But, you know, since this particular story is about AT&T, AT&T just said there's, there's no more unlimited data. You can't open up a new unlimited data plan on Verizon, like I said. At this point, you have to go to these, the third, fourth, or fifth uh, running companies in the industry now, like a Metro PCS, you know, companies like that who do still offer truly unlimited data. But anyway, with your big three or big four carriers, the problem being bandwidth. Bandwidth, bandwidth, bandwidth. We've talked about this on, I believe it was just this show last week. Available bandwidth is a huge problem. You have everybody on smartphones now, whether it's iPhone, Android, or any other operating system. That's why they they said, okay, you know what, we just can't offer unlimited bandwidth for everybody to be watching Netflix, for instance, on their smartphone, on their tablet, on everything, and not leaving bandwidth for anybody else that just wants to go and check email, for instance. So the gist of this story is they throttle back, and they don't throttle you. Let's say you're on the 2 gigabit plan, 2 gigabyte plan, not a gigabit, 2 gigabyte plan or a 3 gigabyte plan. If you're getting close to your three, 2 or 3 gigabyte cap, they'll throttle you back. They're purposely throttling you back twofold. First, to help you, pre to prevent you from going over and accruing ridiculous charges, because then they charge you per megabyte or something as you go over your two gigabytes. So to prevent you from these astronomical charges, they start throttling you back to slow you down. And number two, they're also saying, well, you know, you blew through your two or three gigs in 
two out of your four week service plan, we're going to throttle you back to purposely slow you down. I have absolutely no problem with them doing that because there just isn't enough bandwidth to go around. Finally, on a last note before I turn it back to you guys and then I will officially end my tech segment of the week. Also, the other reason that they do it is that they've come up with these numbers of their primary plans now being two or three gigabytes because the average user doesn't even come close to using two or three gigabytes. The person that streams music constantly or does watch a lot of streaming video on their phone or tablet, they might get close to five gigabytes, but the average person doesn't even use two or three, never mind five. So this will not affect the average user at all. I think you I mean, obviously, Ed, you're much more technical than I am, but I think the problem going forward, and I mentioned this when we talked about it's this. It's more of a numbers, <laughs> but it's more of a num. I'm sorry to cut in. It's more of a numbers issue than it is being technical. It's not really technical. It's just looking at the numbers, crunching some numbers. Well, the, yeah, I mean, but the, you know, lo my problem is more looking forward. You know, like you said, the average user right now is not going to be affected by this, but the bandwidth issue and the issue of uh, basically of America not really being set up for the level of wirelessness, if you will, that a lot of the rest of the world have prepared for. So it's like we talked about the whole cell tower issue on one show, I know, but like I think we're going to run into problems in the future because those people streaming movies and music all the time, that's the next generation. Ultimately, you know, you're not. Ultimately, it's going to be a Wi-Fi type technology. You're well, going, the, you're going to have, which there's certain sections of the country where they tried it and it's semi succeeded, semi failed, mostly for financial reasons, where you're going to have community Wi-Fi and, and it's even even now the I, I don't know I don't you know. know go ahead. That. I mean, when we talked about that, though, you mentioned the Wi-Fi thing I wanted to throw in that we've talked about that before, too. That's a part of my problem is we're not really set up for that. It's not just financial reasons. It's that there's a ton of infrastructure building that has to be done before we get there, and we're not really set up to do it. No, I, mean, I was just going to say that, but yeah. the average person, uh, average person now tends to use Wi-Fi a lot on their devices as opposed to 3G, 4G or anything whether it's on the smartphone or tablet. Matter of fact, my tablet is not a 3G or 4G tablet. It's Wi-Fi only. And I am never away from Wi-Fi. I go to any coffee shop, there's Wi-Fi. I go to supermarkets, there's Wi-Fi. I Obviously, libraries are Wi-Fi. My place of business on my day job is Wi-Fi. Communities are Wi-Fi. A, a lot of city parks are Wi-Fi. Part of the problem is that, they're, like Holly says, we are one of the few countries where everywhere is Wi-Fi. I know my mother can go traveling in Europe, go from Switzerland to France to Italy, and be in a little town, smaller than the town I live in, and have and have full capability on her phone. I can't. Well, go, cell service, I not Wi-Fi. Away from my house and not get service or get Wi-Fi. I don't have Wi-Fi in the office that I'm in because the. Because the um, we don't, we don't have it. The Wi-Fi I need, there's no community Wi-Fi anywhere near me. And when you go to other places, you find this all over the world. These people have it, and we don't. And you know, but, but my problem with this article is that when you sell someone something, they have a right to expect what they're getting. This guy was sold an unlimited plan for his iPhone and didn't get it. That's just, just the small plan. print also says that, that the carrier reserves the right to change any of their terms of service at any time during the contract yeah, but period. Know, but you know, Ed, the court ruled that they had yeah. no right to Oh, yeah, it. absolutely. And they, they made $850, big deal. Yeah, well, hey, it may be only eight hundred fifty dollars. Oh, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't want to talk small change. Eight hundred fifty dollars to me might as well be eight hundred fifty million dollars. Uh, <laughs> it's a lot of money, but but it is only eight hundred fifty dollars. So okay, big deal. So they settled for that. But what I'm talking about here is that you're you, just like you said, every company is doing this all the time, and it's becoming an issue because so many people are using so much more of their bandwidth, and these plans. This guy is not the only one to experience this. 
and especially now that there's been a precedent set for ruling in favor of the user on this front, people are going to start stepping forward and say, stop scaling back my internet. No, the throttling back's right. not going to happen. Uh, the stopping of the throttling's not going to happen. Oh, uh, yeah, no, I don't think the throttling's going to stop, but I think people are going to keep stepping forward until something's got to give, because I do believe, like you said, this is a problem that reaches to a grander scale. Because this is one of the reasons that the cable networks are still alive, and they're they're really flailing, and they don't well, know Well, you know, they, it's it's not really too much of a problem from this point on because the true unlimited services are falling by the wayside. And now, if if I were to start, I'm grandfathered in on my Verizon plan with unlimited. If I let it lapse for any reason and then restarted service, I would have to pay the fifty dollars a month for two gigs of data service. So, you know, new customers fall under the new category. So by attrition, the rules are going to change. Ultimately, they're looking for more bandwidth. You know, that's uh, what I'm talking it's, about. It's, yeah, aren't they the ones that create the bandwidth? No, that's government assigned. It's right to, your, right to the FCC. And, you know, there's always auctions going on for bandwidth. They're, the FCC is reassigning bandwidth. They're currently taking away the old IDEN. Nextel frequencies, the 850 frequencies from IDEN technology, and they're going to reassign that to GSM or CDMA to expand reg regular, in air quote, cellular technology. So there's constantly this game being played of reassigning bandwidth technologies to where it's needed. But I think this, this is a long ongoing process. Yeah, but that's the problem I think, Ed, is that I think, like, the, I think the technology, like, they're reassigning, they're doing all these other things to try to make it last a little longer, but ultimately it's a stopgap measure. Yeah, well, nobody will argue that this country just didn't set up cellular service properly in the first place. And yeah, that's no, true. I agree with that. Well, and also I think it extends to the problem we also are not set up with our wireless infrastructure properly, and that's going to bleed over, and that's why the problem is happening on both fronts. Basically, there's all of this needed communication, you know, techno communication connection. I, I don't know what the word would be, but, you know, people need to connect, and there's just not enough bandwidth out there under any under any front you know not not there's not enough wi-fi out there there's not enough wire there's not enough uh, cell towers out there and ultimately we are falling behind on both fronts and that scares me they whoever they is just didn't see this coming you yeah. know keep keep in mind i was on the cutting edge of cell phone technology i'm not bragging it just happened to be gene knows the person that i'm speaking about i knew this fellow in pennsylvania who had a towing company me and Gene both worked for him, as a matter of fact. And when cell phones first came out, they were those old brick bag phones, the oh, cell yeah. phone in a bag. That was in the early 90s. And he decided that would be a g great service for his towing company. And that was my first foray into cell phones. I have had one ever since. I had his initially, and then around that same time, I bought my first StarTac, Motorola StarTac, handheld phone. So I was on the cutting edge of cell phone technology back in the early 90s. So we're talking only 20 years. I think the problem is that they, as I said, whoever they is, didn't see this coming. Tw only 20 years ago, we were using analog bag-in-the-box cell phones. Yeah, but how is it they saw and look at where we are today. Asia. And we didn't see it coming? That's what I'm saying. They didn't see it coming here. I'm talking about this country. They didn't see this coming. Somebody fell asleep at the wheel in this country. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not standing up for them by any means. Oh, Somebody no, no, fell asleep no, no, at the yeah. wheel in this country. But what I'm saying is that, I mean, we even have the same problem with, uh, as people are starting to stream more movies on Netflix and Blockbuster and all these, and, and, and Hulu and the whole bit, we're finding that cable companies are, 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 are having to expand their bandwidth to, to residential customers. They used to be uh, excluded for, uh, for commercial use because people are just streaming a lot more stuff. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's I think, what Ed and I were discussing is this is this is far-reaching, and I'm sure it's not over. We'll talk about it nine or ten more times because this is, this is a pretty, pretty deep, deep problem for people in our line of business, <laughs> I must say. But I guess let's let's move on. If, you're, if you guys are ready, you're ready to move on to uh, maybe talk about some uh, illegal aliens well, and maybe LAPD. Oh, one. illegal aliens. That sounds like one of Larry's favorite topics. Actually, it's one of my pet peeves as well. Go for but it. 
you know, well, the, well, apparently, according to the article here, the uh, Los Angeles police chief, Charlie Beck, said that California should issue driver's licenses to illegal immigrants. Now, not wanting to go through the whole story, I have a problem simply with the fact that a driving, first of all, is not a right. It's a privilege. The state has a right to issue or not issue driver's licenses to anybody for almost any reason. But the key word in that is illegal. People who broke the law, they want to give them legal drive. And I understand why he wants to do it. But again, you're rewarding someone for breaking the law. And unless you're going to, I mean, and I don't think that they're going to be using these, the, the paperwork this guy says toward anyone. No, because you don't have to show proof of citizenship. You don't have to prove residency for a driver's license. But I just find that distasteful that you're going to give somebody a legal driver's license who's here illegally. Gene, any comments or thoughts on this being a resident of Los Angeles County? Yeah, I uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a hard um, that's a hard thing to talk about because you know there are so many illegal aliens out here, and to you know to issue them a driver's license, sometimes you know unfortunately, their driving is not the best in the world, okay? Because uh, they're from uh, you know, Mexico and different countries like that, and they don't adhere to our laws too easily, you know. And to give them a driver's license to drive like they are used to driving, I think is like uh, opening a big can of worms. It really is. I mean, they really need to rethink this whole policy, whatever they're deciding to do. I like it, and here's why. <laughs> I think, and this is There's for you guys. Surprise. This art, well, I, I was actually going to tell you, I, I wasn't really going to take a stance on it, but I have a thought for you guys. You do have, because, let's say, from, from your point of view, we, we have a quote-unquote problem with illegal aliens in this country. Well, think of it this way. You know, now they're, they're having to be sneaky, as Gene said, they're having to be sneaky about driving, which means they're not basically required to do anything. What are you going to do with them if you catch them? You might take their car away, but that doesn't stop them from going again. They're sure well, not buying insurance. Exactly. They're not buying insurance. Whereas if you require them to have a legal driver's license and you don't like punish them in any of the ways we think of, you have a way of regulating their driving. And I can see sort of where this LAPD guy is coming from. He's like, listen, this will give me the power to do something about these people on the road to make it safer for other people. What are you going to do? Write him a ticket? Yeah, dude. They, if they have a driver's license, he can also take it away. Then they keep they driving they anyway. They drive anyway. Exactly. Well, but I mean, it gives it does give them a way to regulate and a way to count people and a way to give them something to learn and they can even I mean yeah so what if it I don't know but then to take that a step further then what do you do ultimately if you have to throw them in jail or something you don't throw them in jail because they're illegal aliens you deport them uh, I don't know well there's, and, there's what comes, regulation what comes right there legal tuition for schools I mean you know I mean I it, it's it's what it is. <laughs> But that, you know, but it, once you once you go to one location, once you go to one issue, it opens up a whole Pandora's box of other issues that can be coming through. Yeah, because but we, but people in this guy's position cannot just ignore these issues because of that fact. Because that could lead, that could be the fact for everything that anybody ever regulates anywhere. Like I said, I have a pro again. My, and I tell this story to people. My parents were both. My, my, when my mother got here with her. My, my mother was born here of parents that got here legally that were not expected to return to their home country and were called back. My father was born in Europe, came here, joined the U.S. Army, got citizenship, did everything the legal way. And every time that you reward illegal aliens, you're slapping people in the face who spent the five years, who did, who did the job legally and, and didn't have to. Why would, I, why would I go through the system if you're simply going to give me a driver's license and eventually, you know, and I can do what the hell I want? Lobster, should illegal aliens get driver's licenses or no? He doesn't think people who are naturalized should be... Well, let, let him be answer. Wait a minute. No, I think, first of all, if you break the law to enter the United States, you do not deserve a driver's license. And this is a short story, which actually, and what I'm about to mention, actually happened to me a few years ago after I left the East Boston Post Office. The street behind the East Boston Post Office is a one-way street heading towards Meridian Street. Cars on both sides of the street are all parked in the same direction, which is a good indicator that it's a one-way street. And as I was coming up the street behind the East Boston Post Office, here is this clown coming down the street the wrong way, 
there are do not enter signs. This person stopped and somehow, you know, like I got the person to stop. I don't know how. Both windows are down. And I said, this is a one way street. Whether this person was here legally or here illegally, they didn't speak a word of English. But since the cars on that street behind the post office were parked, all pointed in the same direction, that should have been a good indicator. I mean, he was and only that, going one way. But the <laughs> wrong, but, but the wrong way. But down there's the a good street. point. This person, we could assume, didn't speak or read a word of English, and yet was driving and couldn't even understand the signs. More than likely. And but, we're using international road signs now for most of the time. Problem that the problem that I is is that you know, when you when you start giving a, a legal driver's license, you get them a legal identity, a legal identification that can now be used to open bank accounts. Let them go out, let them come in, let them do the five years, let them go through the system properly and the way that everyone else has done it. Let them get their legal status. Then get your driver's license, but you're rewarding. It's like we were saying, well, you've been here 25 years. You robbed the bank 25 years ago, so we're going to let you keep the money. You don't have to do anything. Breaking the law is breaking the law. And, in you know, in theory, I, I agree with Holly's, Holly's or the police, L.A. police chief's theory here that by licensing these people, I could see where, where Holly's coming from, if not the police so chief. So can I. That, you know, you could better regulate and better keep an eye on these people because now they're in the system, quote unquote. You know, but then like I said, so they, they could still do something wrong if they still break the law. Well, what recourse do you have? Because they're still ultimately here illegally. You you deport them then or something. I I don't know. I don't know if there's a simple solution to this. I don't think this. they want to be in the system anyway. I mean, if they're in the system, they can now be found by ICE or by whoever. Yeah, they don't want to be and found. They don't want to be in the system. They want the driver's license, which is fine, but the drive, they, they're worried about, about giving, them Ill, uh, giving them legal driver's licenses not for their sake, but for the sake of other licensed drivers on the road. You know, if, if once you're in, they, most of the people, and I've met illegal aliens saying, I'm not going for that. Why am I going to put myself in a system that down the road is going to get me deported? Well, and like I said, I didn't say they would go for it. And I don't know that I agree or disagree with it, but I can see, I can see the side of it where. Yeah, it, and I, I agree with your, that, that theory, yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sorry, you know, that's sort of, I'm glad Ed got on board with me on that, because that's sort of all I was thinking. You know, otherwise, I just think, I think it's a difficult, I think the entire issue is difficult in the first place, because a lot of these people just want to become citizens, and they're, and they're, they're escaping a bad situation, and there are certain doors that are open for them, but there are certain things that are harder. I, I wish everybody could do it legally. I think we're a melting pot country. I think we're a place where a lot of people came from other places, and I, I would like for all of us to be legal, but obviously that's not the case, and people in places like L.A. have to deal with this on a grander scale than in the rest of the country, and it makes it difficult. You have, you have illegal aliens in every state, no matter, and it's not. And to be in all fairness to people from Mexico, it's not just Mexicans or, or Latinos that are illegal. I tell people I met a girl on a train. Canadians too, eh? No, but I met a girl one time who was from Kenya. Joke she had right been over here, his head. She had been here from. <laughs> she had been here as a student and let her student visa expire, which makes her an illegal alien. And as far as the world of science. Apparently, nomad alien planets have been, uh, have been uh, filling our Milky Way galaxy, and uh, according to science, it's 50,000 to 1. Now, a nomad planet, a, a rogue planet, or nomad planet, is a planet that does not circle a, a specific star as ours does. And apparently, there are about 50,000 to 1 as far as value on that. So, NASA's looking into it, and uh, I'll get more information as I can on it. Cool. And I what mean, about the last one? All right. Well, you know, Fred really wants me to talk about Kate Goslin. Uh, <laughs> no, I really don't. But if people are out there because I see the question I have with her is what makes her a celebrity? Well, yeah. So, OK, so Kate Goslin, for those of you who don't know, and God, I hope it's everybody, um, was on a reality show called John and Kate Plus Eight. Now, uh, the, on the show, a lot of the discussion that happened between she and her husband was whether or not they should have their abnormally large family on a reality show, they had gotten pregnant and were had gone through uh, in vitro or, or whatever and had ended up with a large number of kids. They have seven-year-old twins and then seven-year-old sextuplets, so a lot of kids, eight kids. 
And uh, and throughout the show, obviously, he was sort of unhappy with being on the show. She said, this will be a good thing for the family. Uh, eventually, they got divorced. And so now it's just her alone with these eight kids. And she's done Dancing with the Stars, and she's done a couple of other things. But she uh, she was on Dr. Drew this week, and basically he asked her how she was doing. And she said, you know, I'm really lonely. I'm a mother of eight, like, all by myself. Like, I'm really lonely. And apparently a lot of people felt like that Who was... Who cares? Yeah, that's sort of how I felt about it. I mean, not that I don't care, but listen, there are a lot of single mothers out there with a lot of children who have a difficult time. And, and you know, it, it sucks. It sucks for all of them. You know, the best I can say is, hey, at least there's a voice for them out there on TV. But on the flip side, it's kind of like you said, Fred, you know, I, why do we care about her and not them? The problem, the problem that I have with this is that the reality, and people got to remember something, the, the network that put on the reality show, whether it be Lifetime, whether it be Discovery, whether, whether it, these people got paid for their time. So they made a lot of money for this, on this show. The kids got the exposure. They got the exposure. I mean, the woman's on Dancing with the Stars. What makes her a celebrity? Because she and her husband were on a show together. I mean, she's done nothing I mean, as far as, as, as doing any kind of celebrity, yet she's in the news all the time, and she's talking to Dr. Drew, who I have no respect for in my own, in my own opinion. But the, uh, the problem, you know, she said that she has 11-year-old twin, 7-year-old sectuplets by herself without the support of a partner. Well, what happened to all that money that you made from the Discovery Channel? It's not going to be easy, it's not gonna be easy for her to, to, to find a partner having eight kids, no matter what you do. Right or wrong doesn't matter. No, I mean, no, it's true that it's true that it's going to be hard for her because she has eight kids. But that's sort of the point that I'm making is like, yeah, it's not good. And there are a lot of mothers who have this kind of difficulty. And as far as the money's concerned, come on, Fred, eight kids. It doesn't matter how much money you have. That's going to go real. No, I understand. That. Sorry for her, but I feel just as sorry for the other mothers out there who never had a reality show who are in the same situation. And there are quite a few. Go ahead. Sorry, G. I was just going to say, I feel more sorry for the kids than anything else. <laughs> yeah, it's always the kids, yeah. yeah. They're the ones that have to deal with everything that's going on, you know, and um, she's not doing anything to uh, think about the kids and how they're feeling. She's more worried about herself and about what's going to happen to her. Well, isn't it always the kids? Isn't it yeah. Michael Jackson's kids? Isn't it Whitney mm -hmm. Houston's daughter? You know, isn't it always exactly. the kids? Yeah. Amen. Amen, Jean. Well, I guess uh, I guess that's it for this week, huh, guys? Sorry, I tried to wrap it up earlier, yes, but I think not, this is not much left on my plate. Uh, I'm done. Any obits this week? Well, um, we do actually have an obit this week. Uh, Marie Colvin, a very respected reporter. Uh, she's American from Long Island, but she reported in Britain. For, uh, she worked for the Sunday Times. She was 56 years old, and she was killed by a bomb in Syria this week, along with her young photographer, uh, Remy Ochlik, who was a French photojournalist, and they were, they were there together. They were basically in a house, and they had run to get their shoes, to get their shoes on so that they could run away from the bombardment that was happening. And while they were getting their shoes, the building next to them blew up and killed them both and uh, also injured their uh, Paul Conroy, who was a photographer who was also working for the Sunday Times in that building. Her mother had reported that she was supposed to be coming home the next day. And one of the things I think is really, really beautiful about this woman is that uh, Marie Colvin was basically always on the front lines for her whole career. If there was a war that the world at large was not getting, that she felt the world at large was not really watching and not really paying attention to anywhere that there were women and children and people who were not involved in wars that were being murdered uh, she basically made it her business to be there and uh, she had an eye patch because she was injured on the front lines from a, another foreign war and I just think that uh, that this is a sad day for journalism and it's important to recognize that but I also think uh, you know one of the things her mother said when she opened the door to the journalist is that this is the way she would have wanted it to happen and as far as she's concerned people have to keep reporting these kinds of things until you know until these sort of things don't exist anymore Holly what um, what news service does she work for she worked for the Sunday Times okay okay that's in London wow. right and uh, as far as I know, the last report that she filed was with Anderson Cooper on CNN just a few hours before she was killed. 
It was. She uh, She is on camera talking about a baby that she watched uh, bleed to death because it had uh, gotten shrapnel in the left side of its lung. And basically she said that its little belly just kept going up and down until it didn't anymore. And it was just fighting for its life. And the doctor took a look at it and said, there's nothing I can do. That's sad. Yeah, so oh. she she died doing what she was passionate about. And I'm sure that her her last prayer was more or less that there wouldn't be a need in the future. You know, that these sort of things would not be happening in the world. So I hope she is, uh, I hope she is at peace, or if not at peace, just inspiring another generation of journalists to go out there and expose what's going on in the world, because I think that's what she would have wanted. Amen to that. Wow. So with that, from Boston, Massachusetts, I'm Ed Jupin. And from Swiftwater, Pennsylvania, to Pocono Mountains, I'm Fred Boaz. From St. Louis, Missouri, I'm Holly Hurley. From Brooklyn, Massachusetts, I'm The Lobster. And from Los Angeles, California, I'm Gene White. Thank you for joining us for another As We See It. We'll definitely see you next week, everyone. Have a wonderful week.